Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives to hear from Joanne Freeman about her latest book, The Field of Blood Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War. Whether you're here in the theater or joining us on our YouTube station, I'm pleased that you could join us. Before we hear from our speaker, I'd like to let you know about two programs coming up here in the next couple of weeks. On Thursday, October 11th at 7, we'll celebrate NASA's 60th birthday with a new documentary um, from Discovery, Above and Beyond NASA's Journey to Tomorrow. The film covers the agency's many accomplishments in space and sheds light on the vital role NASA has played in measuring the health of our planet. And it will be introduced by Dr. Paul A. Newman, Chief Scientist for Earth Sciences at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Then on Tuesday, October 16th at noon, Harlow Giles Unger will tell us about his new biography, Dr. Benjamin Rush, the founding father who healed a wounded nation. Rush, a leading physician in early America and a signer of the Declaration of Independence, was also among the first to call for the abolition of slavery, equal rights for women, and improved living conditions for the poor. Check our website, archives.gov or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports our education and outreach activities. And you can find information at archivesfoundation.org about the foundation and how to join. Many journalists and authors are writing about the decline of civility and collegiality in today's, today's political life. In the decades before the Civil War, however, fighting words were often accompanied by actual fights. Joanne Freeman's new book takes us into the houses of Congress where threats and intimidation accompanied fistfights, canings, and, and drawn knives and pistols. To help tell her story, she introduces us to eyewitnesses Benjamin M. Brown French, a clerk in the House of Representatives whose journals were published with substantial support from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, the grant-making arm of the National Archives. The Field of Blood is receiving laudatory reviews. David Reynolds in the New York Times calls it an absorbing, scrupulously researched book that, like other good historical works, casts fresh light on the period it examines while leading us to think about our own time. Freeman enriches what we already know and tells us a lot about what we don't know. In writing for the Christian Science Monitor, Randy, D Randy Dottinga says, Freeman's wry touch and appreciation for the absurdities of politics and politicians give the book a burst of energy and readability. Now it's time to hear, a fascinating, hear the fascinating stories of this contentious yet little known era of, the, of our congressional history. Today's guest, Joanne B. Freeman, is one of the nation's leading experts on dirty, nasty politics. She is a professor of history and American studies at Yale University and has commented on history and politics, past and present, on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, and PBS, as well as in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Her award-winning history, Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic, was declared one of the year's best books by Atlantic Magazine, a co-host of the popular history podcast, Backstory. Freeman appears frequently in documentaries on PBS and the History Channel. Her online course, The American Revolution, has been viewed by hundreds of thousands of people in homes and classrooms around the world. And it's a personal pleasure to welcome Joanne to my house. She was a fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library when I was director of libraries there working on this book. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joanne Freeman. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for coming. It's my great, great pleasure to be here uh, and to speak with you about my just published book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to Civil War which tells the previously untold story of physical violence in the House and Senate chambers in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Now, in the 
admittedly many years that I've been working on this book, uh, I've discovered that most Americans know about one violent incident in Congress. They don't always know the details, they can't always give me the names, but they do know that there was one violent incident, and that of course is the violent caning of abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner in 1856 while seated at his desk in the Senate chamber. Normally when I would tell people over the years, and I will confess it took me 17 years to write this book, <laughs> over those 17 years, almost 100% of the time I would say, it's, I'm writing a book on violence in Congress, and that person would go, Oh, there was that guy. It's like, yes, there was that guy, Charles Sumner. The title of the book actually comes from a response to Sumner's caning. Not long after the attack, a friend of Sumner's wrote, that blood would flow, somebody's blood, on that field of blood, the floor of Congress, I have fully expected. Now, First of all, that's the kind of quote that a historian sings hosannas for. You know, Thank you, history gods, for giving me that quote. Um, it, it comes from an amazing letter, but, and of course, one of the most striking things about that quote is, to that writer, the violence wasn't a surprise. He was expecting that violence. And actually, he names a string of other people who he also expected to get beaten in the Senate. So he literally called the floor of Congress the field of blood. That quote, which I discovered early on in the process, clearly told me that there was a story here that had not been told that needed to be told. And yet, there was a lot of violence on the House and Senate floors between 1830 and 1860, which is roughly the period that the book covers. In fact, I found roughly 70 physically violent incidents in the pre-Civil War Congress. And by violent, I mean canings, shoving, fist fights, people pulling knives and guns on each other, dual negotiations and duels, although obviously the duels are not happening in the House and Senate chambers, um, and then occasionally mass wild melees, usually in the House, with bunches of men throwing punches, tossing the occasional spittoon, rolling in the aisles, and a handful of street fights with fists, bricks, and the occasional umbrella. Now, I will bet many of you are thinking something that I was thinking towards the beginning of this project, which is, that is a rather dramatic story, so why hasn't it been told before? I asked myself that question many times researching this book, and there is a good answer. Most of the violence, and most of the incidents that I'm writing about in the book were censored out of the period's equivalent of the congressional record. There are clues in the record, but you only notice them once you know that the violence is there. So for example, every now and again, the record will say something like, the debate became unpleasantly personal at one point. <laughs> in which case, uh, in one such case, a congressman pulled a gun on another, which is indeed unpleasantly personal. Or the record will say, there was a sudden sensation in the corner, and say nothing else. And on one occasion, that meant that two congressmen began brawling and they flipped over their desk. Enormous brawls, I mean like mass brawls, get, tend to get mentioned, but usually in just the barest detail, as in the case of one enormous fight in 1849 that was summed up by what I've always thought of as a, a rather poetic congressional reporter. He put in brackets in the record this sentence, the house is like a heaving billow, <laughs> which kind of captures what it must have looked like to the reporter at that moment. What you don't see in the equivalent of the record is the kind of detail offered in this account of a house fight that I found in a diary. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about this diary a little bit further on in my comments. So here is one eyewitness account of what one person saw in the midst of one of these congressional fights. The speaker was crying at the extent of his voice, order, 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 exclamations from the crowd of damn him, down with him, where are your Bowie knives? Order, gentlemen, for God's sake, come to order. Go it, Arnold, knock him down. Okay. Eyewitness account of a fight happening on the floor of the house. That kind of detail is nowhere in the equivalent of the record. Why is it not there? Well, in part, that has to do with the nature of the Washington press in this period. In the 1830s, the Washington press consisted of a handful of men working for a handful of local Washington newspapers. They sat in the House and Senate. They scribbled notes of the debates. They often checked them with the congressman who had been speaking and then published their accounts, not only in newspapers, but also in spin-off publications that essentially acted as a congressional record. 
The newspapers that these reporters worked for were unquestionably and unapologetically partisan. So objective news was not in the realm of what people were hoping for in this period yet. So as a reporter, it was pretty much in your interest to make your party's congressman look good. It was also in your interest as a reporter to make congressmen look good because Congress granted government printing contracts and many a newspaper relied on those contracts for survival. So you wanted to keep congressmen happy. Plus, the fact of the matter is that unhappy congressmen occasionally slugged the reporter who made them unhappy. So you did not want to displease congressmen. So the Washington press had many reasons to smooth over the rough edges of what happened in Congress, which means that although the Washington press played up the bravado of many congressmen, they left most of the violent details out. So the answer to the question, why hasn't the story of congressional violence been told, is in part, it's a very difficult story to find, which helps to explain why it took me 17 years to write the book. Finding the violence was a challenge. Given the censored record, you're probably wondering how I did indeed find these 70 congressional fights. In fact, you might be wondering how I came across the topic of congressional violence at all. And the truth is, I essentially stumbled across it. When first pondering my next book project, to follow my first book, and my first book was Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic, uh, which was essentially about political combat on the national political stage in the first 10 years of the government. So clearly I'm interested in combat, political violence, political culture. So I thought, okay, well, I want to continue those themes. I want to aim for something bigger. Not quite sure what I'm going to do next. I'll jump ahead a couple of decades and see what Congress and what politics looks like in that period, and maybe the differences somehow will inform me about something that I want to write about. I knew that one congressman killed another congressman in a duel in 1838. So I decided, OK, well, if I'm plunging in with no real sense of what I'm doing, I'll go to 1838. I found the private correspondence of a congressman from the same state as the fellow who was killed. And I just began reading his private correspondence. Now, as luck would have it, this particular congressman wrote to his wife almost every day. And I soon found that his letters were filled with moments of violence or near violence. People pushing up their sleeves to throw a punch. People actually throwing punches. At first, I actually thought he was probably making things up to entertain his wife, because I thought, I've never heard of these incidents before, and there's a lot of it here. How can this be? He, maybe he's some for, somehow, I don't know why I would have thought his wife would be entertained by the idea <laughs> that there's fighting going on in Congress. But over time, there was just too much in his letters for me to even believe that somewhat sad theory. So I turned to the private letters of other congressmen. And in the three months that I spent researching at the Library of Congress, I never opened a congressman's private papers without finding at least one physical confrontation. In the end, by digging in private correspondence and diaries and then comparing my gleanings with the period's congressional record and with whatever I could uncover in congressional newspaper coverage, I found so much violence that I had to tell the story. And I have to, for the purposes of the National Archives, in honor of the National Archives, um, I have to offer you the story of the little bit I found here. Um, I, I adore researching. I love researching. So you know, the, hard, the writing is hard. The researching I could do forever, and I have to sort of stop myself from researching after a while. And when I was here at the National Archives, um, I was researching a particularly contentious committee meeting uh, in 1837. Uh, in which the fellow who was testifying had called one of the congressmen in the hearing room a liar in the press. So he was not really pleased with the fellow testifying. And so, among other things, he, he was so angry at this man, he told him he didn't want to hear his voice in the committee room. So they would ask him questions, and he would have to write the answers down on little slips of paper so that they wouldn't have to hear his voice, which I read about. But what I found here at the wonderful National Archives was the box containing the records of that committee and the little slips of paper, <laughs> which was kind of amazing to, to find. Like, oh, it really did happen that way. Um, and I should add, actually, that, that that committee meeting didn't end well, despite the fact that he was doing what he was supposed to do on the little slips of paper. Um, ultimately, the fellow who had been called a liar got angry, jumped up, pulled a gun. There was a scuffle. Nobody got shot, but it was 
another moment of glory in the US Congress from the 19th century. Now, not surprisingly, when you look at individual moments like that, over the 30-year period at the heart of my book, you see patterns. So for one thing, you definitely see the power of political bullying. Generally speaking, congressmen divided themselves into two kinds of men. There were fighting men and there were non-combatants. And th those are actually their words, not my words. They referred to certain men as fighting men and other men as non-combatants. Most fighting men were Southerners or Southern-born Westerners. They tended to be armed. They tended to be willing to fight. And most Northerners were non-combatants, which means that generally speaking, Southerners bullied Northerners in Congress, often to protect the institution of slavery. They insulted and threatened and sometimes assaulted Northerners to intimidate them into compliance or silence. And for a time, this strategy worked quite well. Southerners had an outsized influence on the floor of Congress and protected their slave regime in the process. So in the same way that the Three-Fifths Compromise gave Southerners an outsized representation in Congress, they had this cultural advantage that they were more willing to be violent. They were more comfortable with man-to-man -man violence in Congress than Northerners, and they used that to their advantage as well, which isn't to say that Northerners weren't violent, but Northerners were particularly good at rioting. <laughs> Southerners preferred man-to-man -man violence. Now, for a time in the 1830s and for part of the 1840s, much of the fighting was between men of different parties. So for the most part, Whigs fighting Democrats. And both parties had their share of fighting men, so I suppose you could say the teams were balanced. But in the 1850s, things began to change, partly because of Western expansion and the rising problem of slavery on Western lands. The nation's slavery problem intensified and national politics became increasingly polarized. At the same time, a new form of technology, the telegraph, made matters worse by transmitting news around the nation with breakneck speed before politicians could spin the news as they saw fit. And the end result was more violence in Congress, particularly given that the American public was increasingly cheering on their congressmen to fight for their rights. And this was as true for Northerners as it was for Southerners. As Northerners began to get a sense of the degree to which their representatives were being silenced in Congress, they began to vote fighting men into Congress. The anti-slavery Republican Party came to power in the mid-1850s based on their promise to fight the slave power, and that was their phrase for it. And in Congress, working alongside Southerners, these Northern fighting men stayed true to their promise fighting Southerners with resistance, and sometimes with fists, and even occasionally with guns. Again and again during debate in the second half of the 1850s, Northerners, Republicans, rose to their feet and insisted that they were a new kind of Northerner, a Northerner that had been sent to Congress to fight. So you can get a sense of why the late 1850s were the bloodiest years in congressional history. It has to do with the slavery problem and it has to do with the way that that was being debated in Congress. These congressmen were being elected and urged by their constituents to fight. So the field of blood doesn't tell a story of violent congressmen isolated in Washington. It's a story of a nation being torn in two with Americans cheering on their congressmen to fight. And I found one particularly dramatic example of this link between constituents and congressmen and violence in an 1856 newspaper. It's a totally small little trivial incident, but um, it haunted me, and I couldn't wait for the moment when I could put it in the book because to me it's so powerful. Um, it's, it just tells a little incident in Massachusetts. There's a Massachusetts congressman. He's at the train station. He's heading back down to Washington after being on a break. And he's met at the train station by a group of constituents, that, and they give him a gift on his way back to Washington. The gift was a gun. And it was inscribed with the words, free speech. Right, amazing. Right? It always kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of my head. The, these people literally wanted their congressmen to fight for their rights and to fight for their right to say what they wanted and defend what they wanted on the floor of Congress. And fight congressmen did. 
um, towards the beginning of the project, um, I found an amazing um, document that kind of shows you the sensibility of that moment. It, it actually is a pact, a confidential pact, um, by three congressmen uh, from 1858, I believe. It starts out the book. And what these men describe for posterity, so they're not even, it, it's years later, and they want to put down on paper what it was like to be a Republican anti-slavery member of Congress in the 1850s. And they describe in this amazing pact that they couldn't bear it anymore, that they were humiliated and degraded and their constituents were being degraded and they were being silenced and they couldn't bear it and they didn't know what to do about it. So these three men got together and decided that they would make a mutual pact. They would swear a pact to each other that the next time a Southerner confronted any of them, they would fight a duel. And in the pact, it says, we know that we will be ostracized back home for engaging in this kind of behavior. Duels are barbaric Southern customs, but we can't bear the degradation anymore. And actually what they say, their wording in the pact is, we will fight to the coffin. And what, was, what struck me, what was kind of amazing about the pact, first of all, that it exists is really striking. But what really grabbed, my, grabbed me in the gut, I guess, is at the end of it, they say something along the lines of, um, we are committing this to paper um, so that future generations will know what it felt like, what it meant to fight Congress in the highest institutions of national government, to fight slavery in Congress in the 1850s. So basically, when I read that pact, it was like they were speaking to me, right? We want the future to understand how hard it was to fight slavery. It's an incredible document, but it also shows you these three men who said, we don't want to fight, but we're going to fight. We can't, we can't put up with the way the things are anymore. Now, to capture the intensity of this process, this dramatic story, the book has a guide of sorts at its center. Um, and he's named Benjamin Brown French. Um, Benjamin Brown French is a, came from New Hampshire, a little rural town in New Hampshire. He's a minor clerk in Congress. Um, he comes to Washington in 1833. He dies in Washington in 1870, so he's here pretty much for the course of the book. And what's wonderful about him is, on the one hand, he's always in the circles of Congress. He lives his life in the circle of Congress. And he had an amazing diary. He had an 11-volume diary. And it's not like the boring kind of diary where someone says, you know, lunch with Mr. Jones, dinner with Mr. Smith. It's raining today. He, he wrote everything down. It's actually his diary is where I got that sort of screaming account of the fight that I said towards the start of my talk. It's an amazing diary filled with his reflections and his thoughts and his feelings and his observations. He also had a newspaper column. He had an extensive correspondence. And he wrote poetry about Congress, right? <laughs> when I was writing the book, I thought people are going to think I made Benjamin Brown French up, particularly given that he, he's kind of a Zelig-like character so that Anything that happened or any major event that happened in the circle of Congress in this time period, somehow French is always there. So like someone tries to assassinate Andrew Jackson, French sees it happen. John Quincy Adams has a stroke in the house holding his hand, Benjamin Brown French. Um, and Abraham Lincoln, who's at the deathbed of Abraham Lincoln, running around trying to shut down buildings and deal with national security because no one knows what's happening in Washington. Benjamin Brown French. He, so he's like this person who almost no one has heard of, but he's everywhere. And he was everywhere and then wrote about it in his amazing diary. So I, I once again praise the history gods for revealing to me Benjamin Brown French's diary because just as a source, in and of itself, it was amazing. But more than that, French undergoes a really remarkable transition over the years covered by the book. So he comes to Washington in 1833 as what would have been called at the time a doe Democrat, meaning a Northern Democrat willing to do anything to appease the South and promote his party and hopefully to save the Union. Towards the book's end, he goes out to buy a gun in case he needs to shoot some Southerners. Okay, so by following him along the course of the book, you begin to understand and to really feel how he and many Americans learned to turn on each other over time. So in essence, French enabled me to explore what I call in the book the emotional logic of disunion, the gradual process by which Americans learned to turn on each other to the point of violence. And he does it you know, not in a showy way. He does it in the everydayness of his diary. As a matter of fact, the, um, 
passage where he describes buying a gun, um, he discusses how he's alarmed because uh, by this point, he's a Republican, and Republicans are getting beaten by Southerners. And he says, well, if they're going to come after us and fight us for our ideas, I should be armed. So I decided I would go into town and buy a little gun, the kind I can wear on my body at all times. And my favorite part of the, of the passage is what comes next. He then says, I also bought three pairs of underwear, a dollar a pair. I have a pair on now, and they're very comfortable. <laughs> Which, I adore. Now, I adore because it's silly, but I adore because it, it shows you the dailiness of what he's going through, right? He's not, pe we don't experience history for the most part as though, you know, here is history. We, we live our lives and history unfolds around us. And so here you see someone who's like, I better protect myself in case, in case I need to shoot some Southerners. And hey, some underwear too. <laughs> it's really wonderful. And, and I, I have to add that um, recently, uh, All Things Considered on NPR did um, a story about the book, and they asked me to send them quotes. So I sent them, you know, I sent them actually the, the quote that I started out with about the fight, and I sent them a quote, um, French sort of observing what he thought about Congress, and I sent them the underwear quote, actually not thinking that they would really use it. They hired an actor, and he read aloud all the quotes, <laughs> and he read the underwear quote, <laughs> which made me really stupidly happy, I have to say. Okay. Now, um, 17 years ago, when I began the book, obviously we were living in a different world. I could not have imagined how strikingly relevant this book would be when it appeared in print, right, in a thousand years. Such are the whims of the writing gods. And it is impossible to miss the modern echoes of the field of blood when you consider current events. So the field of blood is a story of extreme polarization, fundamental disagreements about what kind of nation the United States would be, splintering political parties, new technologies skewing and scattering the news and complicating politics in the process, conspiracy theories being spread north and south as the nation's crisis unfolds, panic about the impact of free speech in that fraught environment, and rampant distrust in national political institutions as well as rampant distrust of Americans in each other. It tells the story of one party flouting rules and another party clinging to rules until ultimately they give way and begin to flout the rules too. Now obviously there's a lot that's hauntingly familiar floating <laughs> through that list that I just read out. I am not reading you that list to say that, hey, we're reliving the 1850s or that we're headed into a civil war because history does not repeat but history teaches. And on that count, I think the field of blood has much to say to the present. It certainly tells you a lot about the power and dangers of extreme polarization and about the, the blindsidedness of it, the way in which you become blinded to all but what you want to see. It shows you the dangerous power and persuasion of conspiracy theories to turn Americans against each other and how hard it is to persuade people to see outside those theories. It shows the importance of trust, not just in our national system of government, but of Americans in each other and the real perils of rampant distrust in both of those things. And it shows the importance of Congress, when Congress is fully functional, in creating and preserving a national we. I call it that in the book, right? Congress as an institution, that's essentially what it helps us present, create. When it's not functional, it's not serving that purpose. The past clearly has much to tell us about the present. And indeed, the founding generation considered the study of history to be vital to protecting the American Republic. They assumed that only by understanding events of the past could Americans recognize threats in the present. In that spirit, and in a desire to show you a part of America's historical past, filled with famous and many not so famous people and momentous events that shaped the nation, I offer you the field of blood. I think in ways both good and bad, it is a book for our current times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I am very happy to answer questions. I have been told there are microphones on either side
which I will ask you to come up to if you have a question, and I am more than happy to answer them. Were you able to make a count of how many attacks were initiated by Southerners and how many were initiated <laughs> by Northerners? Strategic question. Um, I don't have a precise number count. I can say that the vast majority were initiated by Southerners. Um, there's a lot of discussion. Actually, John Quincy Adams, there's a chapter that kind of centers around John Quincy Adams. And uh, at one point, he stands up and proposes and defends an anti-dueling law. And part of what he says is the fact that Southerners can stand up and threaten duels, which is provoking a fight and then sort of seeing what the Northerner will do in response, that's trampling the rules of the House. That's skewing the power of Congress. So he says point blank, got too many gun metaphors in the English language, but he does say explicitly that Southerners are the ones who are using the fact that they're comfortable with that kind of culture to step in and provoke fights and then basically wait to see what, how the Northerners respond. In the book, I refer to it as the Northern Congressman's Dilemma. You know, what do you do when you're confronted that way? Do you step up and sort of take on that kind of literal challenge or figurative challenge, in which case your constituents might not approve of that? They're not going to be very pleased if you duel. Or do you back down and not confront the Southerner, in which case you're looking kind of cowardly and not really representing the interests of the folks back home. And you see in the book a variety of different Northerners struggling to figure out how to deal with that situation. It's part of what got me interested in the first place in the topic was I thought, okay, given the really different cultures of violence in North, South, and West, what happens when you put those people in a room and then they have to confront fraught political issues? And, and that's part of what the book looks at. But Southerners take the lead. In so, so how many, if any, duels were, were fought? I mean, you talked a lot about what happened on the floor of Congress. Did, were any duels fought at Bladensburg or any place else? Yeah, there were a number of duels fought. There was one fatal duel in 1838, so one congressman kills another in 1838. That's the only fatality, I think, that I could find in um, violence going on in Washington. But there were a number of other duels uh, throughout this period. The, they're definitely the exception and not the rule. More often than not, there's threats, and then there's negotiations. Sometimes they'll close the door of the House or Senate and negotiate apologies. Sometimes the record will say something like, um, someone will stand up and say, it gives me great pleasure to say that the unfortunate circumstances of the other day have been arranged away and mutual apologies have been given. There'll be no indication in the record of what is being apologized for. You'll just see that whatever it was has, has been apologized. But there were, every few years, there was a duel. Uh, you uh, kind of was, were alluding to this, but um, is one of the lessons that you have, to, if another side's willing to use extreme tactics, you sort of need to match them? So if one side, for instance, hypothetically, doesn't allow the other side's Supreme Court nominee to get a hearing for 10 months. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. <laughs> And if that other side then became, got control of, say, the Senate, hypothetically, would, would the appropriate response then be to sort of match the other side's fervor in their approach? Right. I, I would not say that I'm up here cheering, like, to heck with the rules. Everybody, go for what you want. I'm not actually saying that. But, but part of what I am saying is that process matters, right? Process really matters. And this is not the only moment in time when and nor is it the only political institution when people have done interesting things to the process in the name of what they want. So this, in that sense, this isn't a unique moment. But when you're dealing with hyper-fraught politics, when you're dealing with extreme emotion, it really is process, right? Norms, but also process that, that kind of can bring you back down. When you look at um, the founding period, and you look at all of the documenting that people did in the founding, like Madison taking his amazing notes of the Federal Convention, everything that was said at the Constitutional Convention. The reason why they were recording so carefully the how of what they were doing is because they assumed that they didn't know what was going to happen in the future, and they didn't know what problems would come, but they did assume that they were setting a process in motion that could adapt and that could always be turned back to to set things right. So, and so you see, for example, in the uh, presidential election of 1800, um, when people thought there might be civil war, they were talking about civil war and anarchy. Was Jefferson going to win? Were the Federalists going to win? And in that election, at the end, Jefferson says, well, you know, 
Maybe things were going to go badly, I don't know, but if they had gone badly, we would have just turned to the process, right? We would have had conventions, we would have gone back to the process, we would have fixed things and sort of put them back the way they should be. So I think, I, I will not say that I'm, I'm saying, you know, sooner or later we all have to abandon rules, but I am pointing out the ways in which they have a crucial importance and that we need to pay attention to how they are or aren't being used. And think about that, and, and accountability, holding people accountable, is something that the founders assumed and is something that we should still assume. Thank you very much for an extremely fun lecture. You've told us about the history of uh, congressional disagreements. I guess that's putting it politely. <laughs> it's very polite. Um, I have a memory that I've retained uh, of what I think is a pretty famous congressional fight. Uh, I, I, I was alive at the time. And it was the fight between Strom Thurmond and Ralph Yarbrough. Um, can you remember any of the details about that fight or put it in context, or is that your, just your next research? <laughs> That's right, The Field of Blood, Volume 2. Um, I, I, the book pretty much takes me up to, the, the epilogue deals with Reconstruction because uh, it's an obvious question. People want to know, well, what happens when the Southerners come back to Congress? And so I felt like I needed to track that down. I don't go to the 20th century. I do know that that incident happened. I do know that there are a handful of incidents that happened in the 20th and 21st uh, centuries in Congress. Uh, the book starts out with one, as a matter of fact, that I wasn't aware of until I was writing this book. I don't know the details of that one. I don't know, if, is that the one that took place in an elevator? There's a, I know there's a, a, a sort of wrestling match in an elevator. I, that's that one? Okay, I know that that's all, about all I know about that incident. But what's interesting is, you know, even with all of the extensive, uh, expensive press coverage that we have, even today, there are things like that that are happening that we still don't know about, which kind of reconciled me in certain ways to understanding how an entire world couldn't know about the sorts of things that I was writing about back in that age in the past. Yes, uh, Mr. Freeman, thanks so much for talking tonight. Um, yeah, I had a, a classmate of mine uh, who did a thesis on this topic at my undergraduate my alma mater, very similar material. Um, and he very vividly described a, uh, I'm sure it's in the book, and I don't want to steal your thunder, uh, but um, <laughs> I believe it was on the Senate floor in the 1850s between Senator Butler and Senator Johnston, where um, I believe the senator from South Carolina literally caned the, um, the senator um, on the head, almost beat him into submission. Um, are you familiar with that, and is that in your book, or is it not? Well, so... There's, a, there's an incident with Butler right. uh, of South Carolina. There are a couple incidents with Butler right. of South Carolina. There's a near duel that he fights. Okay. I'm not aware that there's a caning, though. Okay. Um, which, and it's possible. So here's the thing about my 70 incidents. 70 is where I stopped researching. Right here. Okay. Right? Sure. So I, I could almost guarantee if I were a gambling woman, I would say there are definitely more incidents. I just at a certain point had to stop. There was no way I was going to be able to be comprehensive. So it's entirely possible that that's lurking out there and that I didn't come across mm -hmm. it after an X number of years. I, I could hear my graduate advisor in my ears saying, <laughs> you have enough material now to write, Joanne. So I, I stopped. Um, but it could very well be. Uh, even, even when I was no longer researching and really not even any more writing, I still, every once in a while, would look something up and, and you would find, this is what helped me a lot of my research, I'd find one incident and then I would look to see what people said about it. And there's always someone who says, this reminds me of the last five times this happened. And I would be like, oh, there's five other times when this happened. Thank you very much. So it could be. It could so be. Senator, that, ba Senator Butler was prolific and he did have his share of incidents. He definitely had his share That's of incidents, thought, yeah. yes. Thank and you. several of them are in the book. So. I'm just wondering, um, did congressmen who were the aggressor, did they ever pay a price politically or legally? Really good question. Um, so did the, the fighting men, the aggressors, pay any kind of price at all? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> Not really. Um, occasionally there would be some a fine, some kind of a civil fine if there was physical violence that went on, particularly outside of the Capitol. But what's really striking about th these fighting men, these at, at the time they were actually called bullies, people who routinely used violence to get their way were known as bullies, they tended to get reelected. 
There's a, there's a fellow from Virginia named Henry Wise, who is one of my most frequent fighters. I was very sad when he retired from Congress because I was like, oh no, what am I going to do without Henry Wise? And luckily for me and unluckily for Congress, someone else came along and took his place. But um, what's striking about Wise is that at a certain point during his career, and he's in, this is a moment in Congress's history when there are a lot of people who are sort of one-term wonders. They're there for one term and then they're gone. He was, he was reelected six times. And at some point in the middle of his long service, Someone says, you should be ashamed of yourself for all the fighting you're doing and all the trouble you're causing. You should be thrown out of this body. And he says, yeah, try it. <laughs> Throw me out. You know what's going to happen? My constituents are going to reelect me and put me right back here because they put me here to do this. They know what I'm doing. I'm here to defend their rights in any way I can. So very often the, these, these fighting men are being essentially, for a while, they're largely Southerners, but they're being applauded for what they're doing. Wasn't there like a sergeant of arms or security, <laughs> and didn't they try to yes. stop this kind of stuff? So I mean, a couple of things. There's that, and <clears throat> wasn't there an incident which left a blood stain on the steps in the Capitol that I think is still there? And well, when's the last time something bloodstone. like this happened? No, well, for sure. So the first half of that question, yes. So there's a sergeant at arms, there's the mace, right? A, a, a supposedly, when there's a, a disturbance, the sergeant at arms can carry the mace into the disturbance, and it's supposed to awe people back to their senses. <laughs> and it didn't work so well. Yeah, so, so there's a handful of instances in which, uh, partly because of Benjamin Brown French's diary, actually, what you hear is people saying, get the damn mace out of here. Like, we don't really care about the mace. And typically these fights, either they just sort of fizzled out or someone would get between the two major fighters or pull them apart or pull someone's weapon away and they would kind of settle down. There was a sergeant at arms, but there wasn't a lot that you, well, number one, there wasn't a lot that you could do, but more important, there wasn't a lot that people tried to do. Because I think the sense was, if it was a fair fight, if it was conceived of being a fair fight, then the men should be allowed to fight for their reputations and interests. And a striking example of that is, um, takes place in the 1850s, and there's a fellow um, who's at his desk working, and he looks up and he sees a stranger, I believe it's in the house, with his fist clenched, standing in front of a colleague. And as he later recalls this, he says, well, I looked the stranger up and down, and I looked my colleague up and down, and my colleague's a bigger man than the stranger, so I figured, well, if they start fighting, it's going to be okay, because my colleague will probably win. And he goes back to work, which tells you something about the mood in the room. He then looks up and isn't sure if there's a weapon, if, if the stranger has a weapon. So he gets up and stands behind the stranger, waiting to see if he pulls the weapon. If he doesn't pull the weapon, it's a fair fight and he's not going to intervene. If he reached for the weapon, he was going to grab him. So the sense that you didn't want to degrade people by intervening in their fights, if they were fair fights, you sort of let fights happen. Some of this is, is the joy of the 19th century. And some of this really is the fact that this is, these are representatives in a lot of senses of the word, and they're performing before an audience. And that, that mattered. They use the word degradation a lot in this time period to describe Northerners is what they feel Southerners are doing to them is degrading them. Southern is what they feel they're being degraded by Northerners who want to stamp out slavery. Um, and that kind of performance component mattered a lot, too. Um, was the violence always across parties, or were there some political um, congressmen who, in their own party, disagreed enough to fight? Oh, that's a good question, too. So um, broadly speaking, the, the, most of the fighting towards the, in the 1830s and part of the 1840s are party versus party. And then after a while, it becomes really sectional. But it isn't all party versus party. Sometimes there'll be, um, like there are two particular Whigs who really hated each other, represented different branches of the party. And I think maybe four, five, six times these two guys went at each other. So some of it's personal. Some of it is, to be honest, it, evening sessions. You know, people, congressmen would go out to dinner, would drink over dinner, and then would come back and go back on with congressional business. And evening sessions were not popular for that very reason, is that inevitably, Inevitably, is a little strong. I'll be a good historian. Very often, <laughs> there would be violence in evening sessions um, because people were a little tipsy and th they began to get irritated and things would, would take a spin, particularly when um, fraught issues were being up for debate. So not all of them fell down so cleanly across those lines, but generally speaking, it's pretty clear that those are the, that's the overall pattern. 
Hello. Um, so I'm a senior at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I'm a history major. So I was really excited yeah. to come. Hey, <laughs> uh, listen to your talk today. And you've mentioned several times that you've conducted a lot of research and you've had to stop yourself um, you know, before you become overwhelmed. So I, I do have a question about your process. How do you, especially for this book, when there's so much history that you're trying to cover, how do you determine what material or what primary sources make it into your book versus what you're just like, I just don't have enough time or space for? That's a really good question. And that was a really hard thing. I mean, part of the problem with writing the book was the joy of having too much evidence, right? Because any one of these fights, almost all of them, could have gotten their own chapter. Um, and there was all kinds of detail that sometimes I had to, you know, no, you don't, you can't. Sometimes I'd be cramming detail in the footnotes. Sometimes I'd be like, oh, I can, one little parenthetical aside and I can get this great detail in. But in the end, um, you know, I had to rein myself in and really force myself to confront, number one, obviously, what is the main point I'm making? And number two, since a lot of this book has to do with the emotion fueling the politics, how much of that detail is important for people to get a sense of the emotional Im impulses of the people in the book. Now, I, I have a very powerful sense of humor, and so some things are in the book just because I find them endlessly entertaining. Um, and what's amazing to me is some of those things, there are things in that book that for years, they made me laugh consistently for years, right? I'd be like, this is still, this, this one little joke is still making me laugh, like five years later. So some of it, it is for the narrative. Um, but you're right, one of the challenges also was just corralling all that evidence, right? I had to come up with a system for that. I spent a whole year just reading the, the equivalent of the record. I ended up making like a system of different things I would look for in each session and sort of categorize what I saw of them. Um, so the, one of the big challenges was, was dealing with this very fact. Um, and I know, you know, I'm an, I'm an old fashioned researcher, so I'm an index card person and I lay the index cards out on my carpet in the order that I think they're going to go. And I, I know, there's a folder I found after the book was already done, it was all turned in, I started cleaning out my desk. There's a folder and it says, important index cards. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember when I was writing the book. I was like, oh, now I'm just too scared to look in there. But I'm sure there will be many details in there that would have been wonderful in the book. So part of the answer is I lost stuff. <laughs> but it's a really good question. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Dr. Freeman. Thanks for this uh, wonderful talk and oh, book. Oh, sure. Uh, in your research, did you see any difference uh, in, uh, say, the culture of the House representatives versus the senators and where fights were more likely to take place? Which is also an excellent question, and the answer is yes. So um, there were threats and um, intimidation in both houses, but the House was a rougher institution, right? It was bigger. It was different categories of men in the House. People crammed more closely together. There's a cartoon in the book, and I think the title of it is The Gladiators of the Senate, the Bullies of the House. So in the Senate, there were lots of dual challenges and, and sort of verbal threats that then were immediately taken off the floor. In the House, it, they were just you know, smacking each other around over the desks. So the House was, was just much more physically violent, and also, there were fights, there's a particularly dramatic fight towards the end of the book in 1858 that takes place in the space in front of the speaker's chair in the House of Representatives. And what's remarkable about that, and again, it partly has to do with the space and it, it partly has to do with um, the numbers of people, but um, you end up with armed groups of northerners and southerners running at each other and fighting in the space before the speaker's chair. Um, and reporters at the time say, wow, that looks remarkably like a battle. One of the things I say in the book is, you know, you could argue that some of the early battles of the Civil War are fought on the floor of the House. So there is a difference in the form of violence, but there's still the intimidation and threatening and humiliation and the, the, the sort of power of emotions to control or, or shape what men are doing in Congress is happening in both houses. It sounds like in the early period of your book, the Northerners backed down. I'm wondering why they did it. Didn't they actually have a numerical majority? Were they just afraid that the Civil War would start earlier if they didn't back down? A lot of good parts. So, so the Southerners pretty much have a majority of numbers because of the Three-Fifths Compromise. So generally speaking, the Southerners do have power in numbers. 
but also problematic is that the Northerners don't, they don't want to be humiliated. I mean, again and again and again, you see in the beginning of the book, um, someone, for example, there's a committee uh, in which a Northerner is threatened. He wants a committee report to go one way and a Southerner in the committee room wants it to go another way. The Southerner closes the door and says, it's going to go my way or you're going to be really sorry. We know about this because this fellow goes to John Quincy Adams, who also has a wonderful diary, and he explains how this fellow didn't know what to do. It's actually his eyes were full of tears. He was, he was tearful because he didn't know what to do. He ends up resigning from the committee. Right? He doesn't want to be humiliated in front of his peers and then potentially in front of the country. Now that said, kind of like that pact that I described during my talk, they're also, these are men who are representing the interests of the North and their states and their region and their constituents, so they also don't just want to fold and walk away. It's a tricky situation for these Northerners in Congress. As long as there are parties, two functional parties, it kind of is a semi-functional system because both parties have their share of people doing one or the other, you know, bullying or, or being bullied, and it kind of evens out. Where it begins to get a little bit wild is in those later years when for a time at least it's southerners really deploying their numerical advantage and their cultural advantage to really kind of sway things and that's part of what drives northerners ultimately to decide you know what I think we're going to have to fight and that's that really helps the rise of the Republican Party. Excellent talk thank you, thank you. and I can't wait to read the book. <laughs> thank you. Um, so you describe an atmosphere of extreme polarization and dysfunction, and yet we know that there were periods when there was agreement, there was compromise. Did, did you get any sense of how um, people got beyond the dysfunction to be able to come to those compromises? That's an excellent question. And, and it, it, it's a reminder for me to also say, it's not as though all they were doing is fighting and doing nothing else in Congress, right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, Congress was still a functional institution in this period, and it is the period of great compromises, right? There are a series of compromises. You can even see that in the fighting that there were particularly border state men who tended to act as compromisers. They sort of spoke culturally northern and southern and tended to negotiate fights as well as legislation. So yeah, they, people weren't trying to destroy Congress. They wanted what they wanted, and they wanted it to happen through Congress, so in a sense, they need Congress to be functional. They're just pushing as hard as they can to get what they want, sort of against the edges of the institution. So yeah, that for certain there was compromising. There were, and there were people, there were always moderates, in addition to you know, all of the, the bullies and fighting men. Uh, there were people of moderate uh, principles and policies who were also helping to compromise. So it wasn't, I don't want to give the impression that it was just like a, a, an arena of fighting for 30 years. Um, the fighting wasn't constant, but it was routine enough that people expected it. But that said, people wanted Congress to function as an institution, and they were trying to have it function at the same time that they could get what they wanted. And that's kind of part of the balancing act that, that the book describes. Okay, well, um, I want to thank you all very, very much for coming to hear me. I'm so honored to be at the National Archives, I have to say. Thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you enjoy the book.